Welcome to this uh, Data for Good uh, webinar. Uh, we're thrilled to have uh, with us this evening uh, Yogi Schultz, who will be uh, presenting on um, powerful data visualizations. Um, it's great to have you with us. Um, we're getting great uh, response to these online meetups um, while we uh, handle the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis. Uh, but before uh, Yogi gets started, what I'd like to do is provide a bit of background on, um, on Data for Good um, for uh, those of you that uh, may be new to the, uh, new to the group. So Data for Good, we are a group of you know, passionate, socially minded and curious volunteers. Um, and we use our uh, data analytics, uh, machine learning, AI and project management skills uh, for good. Really our aim is to help uh, nonprofit and social organizations uh, harness the power of data in order to leverage their impact um, in the community. Data for Good Calgary, we're, the, we're one chapter of a uh, national uh, not-for-profit um, organization. Um, uh, my name is Jeff Zakabe and I'm the uh, chapter lead uh, here in Calgary. I also sit on the board of the uh, national um, organization. Uh, but as you can see, we have chapters across, um, across Canada. Um, in uh, Toronto and Ottawa and Montreal and the East Coast and Halifax, Waterloo, uh, Regina, Edmonton, um, and in uh, Vancouver as well. So uh, in Calgary, um, our goal is to put data into action for social good. Uh, we started, um, you know, uh, in 2013, so quite a long time ago, over 1,600 members on Meetup now, which is great. So we, uh, we have by far the largest uh, number of members per capita of the chapters across, uh, across Canada. So we work in a number of different ways. Um, we do these large events called Datathons, which are a three-day uh, in-person event. And, uh, uh, this year, we're partnered with the Calgary Foundation um, and looking forward to having that data fun in the fall of 2020. Uh, we also partner with smaller organizations that may have less data and launch these uh, data core uh, projects um, where we give uh, you as volunteers a chance to um, uh, volunteer with that group. And these projects are done kind of um, offline. Uh, it could be a week, it could be a month to assist these, small, these organizations. We also organize these regular meetups, uh, typically on the fourth Thursday of the month. Um, and most of you have registered to our uh, meetup site. Um, and so please go there for updates and for information. Um, and we also have a Twitter handle. So it's at data for good YYC. So please uh, do some tweeting tonight and uh, let's get some traffic uh, around data for good in Calgary. Uh, these are some of the uh, social and nonprofit organizations that we've worked with uh, in Calgary, the Calgary Found Foundation, the Distress Center, Women's Emergency Shelter, Calgary Arts Development, Commuter Challenge, and many more smaller organizations as well, just to give you a feel. And then across Canada, there's, there's probably over 100 organizations that the various chapters have, um, have engaged um, over time. So uh, please uh, um, continue to join the group, continue to get to, uh, to volunteer and to, uh, to uh, take part in our, in our, uh, in our meetups. So now I'd like to uh, uh, turn it over, without any further ado, turn it over to Yogi. Um, and Yogi, you can kind of do a, a, a deeper dive uh, introduction to yourself, but uh, Yogi is a, is a long-term member of the, uh, the data, data ecosystem here in Calgary, has some amazing experience and knowledge, and uh, Yogi, we're just thrilled to have you uh, with us uh, this evening.
Thank you, Jeff. So what are you seeing on your screen now? Um, I'm not seeing your presentation yet. Okay, can you give me share then, please? Uh, I, I have stopped sharing. How's that? Looks good. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the Data for Good group, and thank you to you and your organizing committee for inviting me to come and speak today. Uh, today, my topic, as it says here, is create powerful data visualizations. We're all aware, I think, that many organizations want to apply data visualization to advance their business plan. In this presentation, I want to increase our understanding of how to create powerful data visualizations. I think we know this task is not easy or obvious. We've all sat through unreadable, confusing, boring, even misleading presentations with their associated charts. Today, we'll talk about how to make these charts more powerful by communicating their message better. Wow. I haven't figured out how to advance yet. There we go. Okay, just a very quick introduction on me. As you mentioned, Jeff, I've been a member of the IT community here in Calgary for a long time. I founded Corbell Consulting over a couple of decades ago, and we've spent most of our time in an information technology consulting and project management role, mostly in the oil and gas industry. I write a regular column in IT World Canada. I've been on CBC Radio, and as many of you know, I spent a couple of decades on the PPDM Association um, Board of Directors. I've spoken to lots of organizations. I guess that's enough on me. Uh, so here is the outline of our top of our topics today. I want to start with uh, an introduction, a couple of remarks, and spend a minute on learning objective objectives. We'll start with a few of those that describe how I want to use our time that we have together today. And the meat of the presentation is how powerful data visualizations are defined by these four concepts. And, and there, first I'll speak about understand visualizations, then how to create visualizations, refine visualizations, and practice and prevent, present visualizations. So through those subtopics, I think you'll get a good sense of how to create more powerful visualizations. And we'll end up with a couple of recommendations and actions that I think we should all think about as we try to improve our work in our presentation of data visualization work. So a lot of the material that I want to present today is derived from this book called Good Charts, the HBR Guide to Making Smarter, More Persuasive Data Visualization. So if you want to get more into it, you can, of course, find this book at HBR. Amazon and you can get either the physical one or the Kindle version if you want to delve into these topics some more. So first, uh, as we contemplate how to visualize the message contained in the data we want to communicate, we're faced with an overwhelming number of visualization presentation choices. Our challenge is to design, refine, present visualization that best fits the data and best reinforces the message we want to convey. We want to communicate the data accurately, we don't want to mislead. We want to be persuasive because we're typically pitching some recommendation. We don't want to oversell, we don't want to misrepresent. We want to be memorable, powerful, leave a lasting impression on our audience. We don't want to be boring. So this presentation is not about best practices for PowerPoint presentations. However, this presentation is what to do once all the data wrangling and data analysis is complete. So what do you do to confect, effectively convey your findings and recommendations once you've cleaned, calculated, integrated, aggregated, analyzed, and forecasted your data using your favorite data visualization tool? And my point in this presentation is that many of us aren't doing nearly enough to think about that, um, perhaps because we've worked so hard on all of the preparatory steps. So I wanna give you the sense of the idea that many of you have done great work, but you still have the opportunity to crash on the goal line if you're not presenting your good work in a way that will resonate with your audience. So let's look at some learning 
objectives first. I want us to understand the design considerations that lead to powerful data visualization. I think we can improve our data visualizations if we take a moment to think about design and not be distracted by our data. Secondly, we want to understand some effective techniques to create data visualizations. There are a small number of techniques that will greatly improve our ability to develop powerful visualizations. And we want to understand the best practices for presenting data visualizations. Investing some time in rehearsal produces significant benefits for engagement and success in selling our recommendations. Uh, you're welcome to take lots of notes. You can even take some photos. However, as Jeff mentioned, you can request or look at the entire presentation later. So increasingly, when an executive sees a line chart that's been thrown together quickly in Excel and then pasted into a, a presentation, he or she wonders why it doesn't look like the simple, beautiful charts in his or her fitness tracker. Or executives may wonder why your Excel graph doesn't look as attractive or as, or as, as easily as understood as a weather app. So I think we can differentiate ourselves, advance our career if we pay a little more attention to what these what this work looks like. So let's start off by the, the first subtopic, understand vi visualizations. It's worthwhile to understand a little bit more about this topic. So I want to start with a brief history of data visualization. Believe it or not, we're all the beneficiaries of about 200 years of thinking and experimentation about how to present data more powerfully. And we'll embark on a whirlwind tour of that history. And the second topic here is when a chart hits our eyes. The science of visualization is hugely influenced by how our eyes and brains work together to observe the world around us and absorb information. We'll spend a few minutes on this topic because this physiology absolutely influences how effective and engaging the design of our visualizations will be. As a software developer or data wrangler, you may be wondering at this point if you're in the right room. I assure you that you are. I want us to think a little outside of our regular technical box in the time that we have here today. So what about this history of visualizations? Well, perhaps the first visualizations were primitive cave drawings drawn in charcoal to describe where hunting opportunities were. I hope I mentioned that we'd start at the very beginning. The second is data in prose. Data was mostly captured in prose for millennia. So there would be literally a sentence like, the man carried 17 bags into the warehouse. That was a receipt transaction. And once we went beyond that, we came to tables and ledgers in the 1700s. They represent our earliest steps toward the structured data that is prized by all of us to, in this very day. And then we have William Playfair in 1786. He published a commercial and political atlas that was full of charts. He produced what are often considered the first modern charts, including line charts, bar charts, and timelines. And then we have this chart here. Histories of infographics often start with this celebrated 1861 diagram produced by Charles Minard that shows the decimation of Napoleon's army during his doomed invasion of Russia. The wide brown swath depicts the size of Napoleon's invading army advancing on Moscow. The narrow black line represents the remnants of Napoleon's retreating army. Imagine creating a visualization that's still admired almost 200 years from, from now. Wouldn't that be exciting? And then we have Florence Nightingale. As I think you all know, Florence Nightingale was a pioneer in establishing the importance of sanitation in hospitals through her work as a nurse in the Crimean War. She meticulously gathered data to relate deaths in hospitals to cleanliness. Because of her novel methods of communicating this data, she was also a pioneer in applied statistics and visualization. Here's a copy of one of her original charts, and here's the modern reproduction of the same visualization. The large blue area stands out immediately. That's the number of deaths due to preventable causes like dysentery, bacterial infection, and accidents. The red area is the number of deaths due to wound. The much smaller black area is the number of deaths due to bullets, cannon fire, swords, and spears. The visualization illustrates what's still true today. More soldiers die in, in wars from disease or industrial accidents than from bullets or, ex or explosions. 
you can have a look at this visualization on the web. Then we have Mr. Willard C. Brenton wrote the first business book about visualization entitled Graphic Methods for Presenting Facts. Britain produced early organization charts. He introduced the pie chart, controversial to this day because we humans can't easily estimate the relative size of the area of the slices. He documented some rules for presenting data and he provided examples of chart types to use and chart types to avoid. Then we have Mary Eleanor Spear. She wrote charting statistics and practical charting techniques. Her books are filled with common sense charting advice. She is the first to view chart development as a team effort. We'll talk about that some more later in this presentation. She also applied various cross-hatching patterns to distinguish variables. She invented the box plot. It's a standardized way of displaying a distribution of data based on five number summary, minimum, first quartile, median, third quartile, and maximum. She was a charting pioneer who worked in various US government agencies and a graphic consultant. Then we have Jacques Bertin. He was a cartographer who wanted to ground his practical ad advice about chart making in a theoretical foundation. Rather than focus on which chart types to use and how to use them, Bertin described an elementary system that still frames and provides the vocabulary for contemporary data visualization theory. He established two ideas that remain deeply interventional, influential to this day. The first principle is the principle of expressiveness. Say everything you want to say, no more, no less, and don't mislead. Choose the visual form that will most efficiently and most accurately convey the data's meaning. If position is the best way to show your data, use that. If color is more effective, use that. His second principle is the principle of effectiveness. Use the best method available for showing your data. This is obviously trickier because even today, determining what is best or most appropriate isn't easy. Often what's best comes down to convention, taste, or even what's readily available. Whoops, I guess. So here are his, so here's his book first. The, and then here are the seven visual variables. The, the, so here's his book, and then here are the seven visual variables that he said were very important. Now the way, the way this is useful to you and I right now is as a quick way to check if your visualization comprehensively addresses these concepts. If you can't explain how your chart addresses these seven variables, you have an opportunity to improve it. Now you don't have to make sure all seven are present. Sometimes it's just important to agree which of them was you're ignoring and why. So these are in decreasing order of importance. So this shows what they looked like in his original book. It gives various examples of these, what these visual variables might look like. Now we have Edward Tuft. With disciplined design principles and a persuasive voice, Tuft created an enduring theory of information design in this book here, the visual display of quantitative information. Graphic excellence, in his view, is that which gives the viewer the greatest number of ideas in the shortest amount of time with the least ink in the smallest space. His data to ink ratio, the, highest, the higher the share of ink on the page that devoted to necessary elements, the better. One of his key phrases is, above all else, show the data. He used this phrase, chart junk can turn bores into disaster and chart junk can never rescue a thin data set. So he emphasized a minimalist approach. That's what's important here. A generation of designers and journalists grew up under his influence. And then we have Jacques McKinley. So the idea, his contribution was automatically encoding data with software. He wanted to create visualizations on the fly at the speed of our thought. He carried Jacques Bertin's work into the digital age 
by adding an eighth variable, the area of the variable of motion. So he was very big on not getting lost in the mechanics of producing the data visualization. And the introduction of the PC and cheaper computing, in fact, enabled that. Uh, he is the VP of Research and Design at Tableau Software. And when you think about the software that you typically use, all of that software claims that they will guide you in making sure that whatever you're creating is effective and follows good principles of design. And I think we can observe that in Tableau and some of its competing products. Okay, now the next topic here is when a chart hits your eyes, or more precisely, when the light from a chart hits our eyes. What is it that actually happens? Let's talk about that. Visuals aren't read in a predictable linear manner, the way text is. We don't go from left to right and top to bottom as we typically do in the West. We should create charts spatially from the visual outward. Notice these lines are well eye tracking lines that, that showed how someone absorbed this particular graphic. You notice how their eyes went all over the place. And you need to keep that in mind when you're designing a data visualization. Okay, and here's how you do that. We see first what stands out. Whatever stands out is what we'll focus on. That's just physiologically how we're built. So in this particular graph, it's obvious. May and December are what, is what our eyes are gonna hit on. And if May and December is what you wanna talk about, about what you want your audience to focus on, then this is a winning chart. If, however, you're trying to make some other point around this chart, then this chart is a disaster because that's not what people focused on first. If, if people focus on the wrong thing, then they'll be distracted and the main idea will fight for attention. So ornamentation, such as colorful symbols, or fancy overbearing borders, they just detract from the main idea. Okay, third point, we see only a few visuals at once. The more data that's plotted on the chart, the more problematic it is. A visual that contains tens, hundreds, thousands of plotted data points shows us a forest instead of individual trees. And you can see that, how busy this chart here is at the bottom right-hand corner. There are multiple time series, lots of colors, lots of text, um, way too many arrows, way too busy. So if you have something like this, you should say to yourself, this is way too busy, this won't work. I'm going to separate these charts out into these data series into multiple charts and talk to each of them. So above all, avoid clutter. Clutter includes too much text, too much data per visualization, and ornamental clip art. We seek meaning and we seek to make connections when we're intellectually engaged. Our minds incessantly try to assign meaning to a visual and to make ca causal connections between, between the elements of, whoops, And so if we make, so the idea here is you want to avoid viewers constructing false narratives about the relationship among the elements of your visualization. Make sure the charts you present at one time are closely related to your main idea. We rely on conventions and metaphors in our Western civilization. We use learned shortcuts to assign meanings to visual cues as the basis of common communication. For example, green is good, red is bad, north is up, south is down, time moves from left to right. What, it, what this means to us is in general, we should embrace and definitely not fight against these deeply ingrained conventions and metaphors in our civilization. Whenever we try to do something different, we create confusion, uncertainty, frustration 
and that will overshadow our message and our effectiveness. So build the story from top to bottom, never the other way around. Okay, let's look at an example chart here. This gray print shows the USA Petroleum Pipeline tab. Tabs are a great design approach to minimizing the number of visualizations per screen. You notice there's four tabs up there. Pipelines are color coded by operator name. The arrows indicate flow direction. The hover produces a small table of information about the pipeline where the pointer is. The histogram at right provides an indication of volume shipped by operator name. The audience engagement is enhanced when visualizations use color effectively, aren't too cluttered, enable user interaction with the visualization, and offer a slider for moving backward and forward in times. And sometimes, like here, use maps to provide geographic context. Now, here are some thoughts on how to improve this one. I believe in maps, especially the, I believe that maps, especially those that cover larger areas like this one, need pan and zoom controls. The title at the top of the map is rather small. The histogram at the right seems squeezed onto the screen. Would it communicate better as a separate visualization? There's an enormous empty space at bottom left around the visual explanation of the pipeline representations. Would that have been better placed at top right on the, above the map of the US? Should the operator color legend have been designed for as three columns to make the text in the legend larger? So things to think about if you were trying to improve this. Okay, so what happens in the land of Dilbert? Instead of alternative facts, we have alternative charts. You want me to put the chart on one page, which would make the text too small for our, your audience to see? Do you prefer a multi-page approach that's confusing and unpersuasive? It's probably better if no one can read it. I won't bother using any real words. I'll just use gibberish. Well, as we know, Dilbert tends to be immersed in horribly dysfunctional situations. Often Dilbert cartoons give the impression that the alternatives presented are the exhaustive list. That's never true. There are always multiple credible alternatives to address visualization, dilemmas, trade-offs, and improvement opportunities. Hi, hey, hey, Yogi. Yes, sir. I just let you know that your your notes were covering your camera, so. Okay. Yeah. I guess people want to see my smiling face here. <laughs> All right. So that's the first topic. Let's go on to the second one, create visualizations. So interactive visualization development tools like Power BI, SAS, Spotfire, or Tableau make it very tempting to just wade in and use the available data to prototype various visualizations until you see something you like, what you might think appeals to your intended audience. What I suggest to us instead is that we plan and consider some design alternatives just a little bit before we wade into the data. Think for a moment about the message you want to convey and who your audience is. Here's a simple framework to guide our thinking. It consists of just two components. What kind of visual com communication do we have want to create? And a procedure to create better visualizations in only one hour. So designing charts so that they're beautiful is not the most difficult part of creating good visualizations. The effort required to express our ideas and recommendations visually as opposed to textually, that's often the greatest challenge. So first question, what do we want our visualizations? What kind of visualization communication do you have to want to create? Typically at the beginning, we're not sure what we want to create. We're often uncertain, we have, may have some ideas, we're not sure what might be best. A good way to identify the kind of visual communication that is best is to answer just two questions that will help us narrow in on which kind of communication we're about to create. Here's the first question. Is my information conceptual or data-driven? Conceptual information is qualitative. Think processes, hierarchies, cycles, and organization. Data-driven information is quantitative. Think of revenue, patients, oil wells, ratings, percentages. And then the second question, and so that creates one axis. And the second question is, are my visuals meant to be de declarative or exploratory? Declarative means to communicate in a statement or a finding to an audience. You want to inform 
and affirm. An exploratory purpose is to look for new ideas we want to seek, explore, consider. So the answers to these two questions lead us to con every consultant's favorite chart, the four quadrant chart. So conceptual to, or data-driven on one hand and declaratory or exploratory in the other direction. So let's look what happens in the four quadrants. There are four, there are four types of data visualizations. The first one here is the idea illustration. It's to visualize an existing idea. Could use metaphors like trees, processes, cycles, organizational chart, process diagrams, doesn't really require any data. The second is idea generation is about rapidly sketch concepts for visualizing new ideas. Visual often these ideas are generated in group brainstorming sessions on whiteboard or famously on the back of a napkin. So that's this side of our quadrant. Now over here we have what we call the everyday data visualization. It consists of charts and graphs we use to express an idea we want to communicate to an audience. Visualizations are usually well designed and based on manageable even small amounts of data. Presentation, visualization is often used in a presentation setting and this is mostly the realm of data analysts and presentations. So the point of my presentation today is to make us aware of the other three quadrants as well in case that's really where we are. We have a natural tendency to end up in this quadrant. Maybe sometimes we shouldn't. And the fourth quadrant is visual discovery that uses data to confirm a hypotheses or make patterns or trends. Often performed by an individual using statistical software such as machine learning, MATLAB, SPSS, Excel, or any other online tools. So this is about finding patterns in the data. So based on our data and the context of our planned visual communication, we'll select one quadrant on this chart as we continue to develop our visualization. Okay, often we end up in the top right, and there's nothing wrong with that, but just, make, just use this process to confirm that that's where you really want to be and you don't want to be somewhere else. Okay, having cho chosen the quadrant we need to be in, we're now ready for better visualizations in an hour. Four steps. First, preparation. Second, talk and listen for 15 minutes. Collaborate with your ideas with the col colleague. And then three, sketch, draw your ideas on a flip chart or a whiteboard. And four is prototype the visualization in more detail. So what we really want to do is have us fight the impulse to select the data and choose a chart type from the preset options of your software of choice. We need to spend just a little bit of time creating context and thinking through the idea that we want to convey to our audience. Okay, drilling into these just a little more detail, these four steps. The first one is preparation. So create a workspace, so an empty whiteboard is great. Secondly, put aside your data. Think broadly about the situation and how you want to communicate. Write down some basics as constant reminders. Who is in my audience? Is it customers, management, technical staff, newbies? And what is my setting? Am I in an auditorium, a large or small conference room? What's the number of participants? Or perhaps even am I creating a book? Or am I in a video conference, which all of a sudden is all the rage in the era of COVID-19? Okay, number two, enlist some help. Get a colleague involved to talk about what you're trying to say or show or prove or learn. Write down words, phrases, and statements as your notes in the conversation you wanna have with your audience. It's highly likely that something you write down will be the key words for the idea you wanna convey. This step addresses a common problem where the presenter or analyst understands the data and the opportunity intimately. The person tends to describe the situation in way too much detail that won't resonate in your audience. The act of explaining the context of the opportunity and the related recommendations to a colleague exposes and resolves this common problem. 
Okay, and then step three is match keywords to chart types. And there's some more of this on the next slides. What, what are some of the keywords? Start sketching, work quickly, try out multiple visual approaches. Deliberately try out two completely different visual forms to check your assumptions about the best approach. So if you're not sure of what to do, ask yourself these questions. Pick something off this map, off this table, sorry, not map. So think of the purposes you're trying to, what, what is it that you've got in your data on the right, and that will lead you to a visualization type on the left. Or another approach to this is a decision tree. If you're not sure what type of chart would look best, look through some decision trees. This is an example for a comparison chart. Answer the question at each junction, and you'll end up selecting one of eight recommended charts. You can also read this article here for visualization types in Power BI. Fusion Charts has a similar decision tree on its website. So there's lots of resources that can help you with this process of choosing what makes sense for the data and the recommendations you have. Then the fourth step is to prototype your approach. Make it more accurate, make a more detailed sketch, use digital prototyping tools if you're not, or even paired prototyping techniques. Now, can you see how using this four-step defined process helps you be more structured in, a, in your thinking, avoid wasting, wasting time, helps us to create a more powerful visualization. Okay, so here's another example chart. This one's about capital exposure and risk. You'll notice there are three histograms across the top. They're very consistent in their use of color. That's great. Um, the question becomes, could some of these charts have been consolidated into fewer charts with more data? Is one of these charts really a drill down into the data of another chart? What about the significant white vacant area at the bottom right? Could have been better allocated to extending the horizontal histogram across the bottom? Uh, should the table at the bottom left be not here at all or be on a separate tab? The click here line at the top occupies prime real estate. These links leading to more detail are better placed more out of the way at the bottom. Uh, could tabs have been used instead of this link? The data is all point in time. There are no trends here. Could trends be usefully added as another tab? I, I'm very big on trend charts as opposed to point in time charts. So think about that in your situation. The title here is so small, it's faint, it's useless. Make it larger with better contrast. It will better communicate what's going on. How do they do it in Dilbert land? I don't have anything useful to say, so I made this pie chart. Ooh, ooh, must be true, because it's a pie. Well, that worked too well. I pledge my life and my fortune to the pie. Like all presenters, Dilbert wants to impress and persuade. Clearly, he's more successful than he's planned in the sense I'm envious of his impact on his audience. However, colorful and artistically well-conceived visualizations with limited facts can razzle-dazzle audience. This reality should create serious introspection about ethical issues for the presenter. Whenever you're thinking of using a pie chart, immediately ask yourself if another pie chart type would be more powerful. The weakness of pie charts is that they require our audience to judge the relative area of the slices. That's not easy for humans to do. Okay, let's move on to refine visualizations. Now that we've got something we're happy with, how can we refine it? How can we make it better? So three concepts here we want to refine to impress, refine to persuade, and then we ask ourselves, are we about persuasion or are we about manipulation? The goal is to confirm our design and to remove extraneous data, graphics, and words that actually get in the way of our key points. So step one, create a, that sense of good design. First, focus on design structure. Make charts look neat and clean. 
every chart has exactly four elements. And we should be cognizant of these and make sure we have that in every element. A title, a subtitle, a visual field, and a source line. So here's a generic chart. Um, within the visual field, I'm including axes, labels, data representation, and sometimes even captions and legends. Give each element a constant weight. The title, maybe 12%, subtitle, last visual field has to be 75, 80%, and the source line is tight, tiny at the bottom. And it's a short phrase that states where the data came from. So align, align these elements to place them into as few actual or imagined horizontal and vertical lines as possible. Avoid too many fonts. One is often just right. Okay, and then focus on de design clarity. Make all the elements support the visual. Remove ambiguity. Be aggressive. Take away as much as possible while maintaining the meaning. Remove ambiguity. You'll notice in this particular chart, there are way too many lines and dots, uh, grid lines, notations, arrows. Let me just show you that again. So that's a great example of what not to do. Okay, focus on design simplicity. Make charts look elegant, beautiful, Show only what's needed. Every element should be necessary, unique, and rendered as simply as possible. Avoid what's called belt and suspender design. One form of emphasis per element is enough. Minimize the number of colors. Probably stay away from gray unless you want some background uh, information. Avoid eye travel. What that means is you place labels and legends in close proximity to what you want to describe. And indeed, if possible, get rid of a legend. Okay, don't create charts that are too busy, too many colors, too much text. Text is probably uh, a proxy for the notes pages of your presentation. Okay, so making a, a chart accurate is not enough. Start by asking yourself, how, what is it that I need to say to, or show to convince my audience that, and then whatever the issue is. Too often we start with, what am I trying to sh say or show? That's much less effective. Now here's something that's really bad because first of all, it's a pie, and second, notice how the legend is as big as the pie. And so maybe you can eliminate the legend by simply labeling the pie, slices. Okay. Make the main idea stand out. Use simple design techniques to reinforce your main idea. Emphasize the main idea that by adding visual information, it calls attention to it, such as colors, pointers, labels, markers. Isolate the main idea by reducing the number of unique attributes. For example, group them together. So here's the simple chart that conveys its message clearly. So the next point is to adjust what's around the main idea. Manipulate the variables that complement or contrast the main point. Remove reference point. Remove things that distract shift the reference points. So this one is obviously so busy uh, that you can't tell what's going on because all those lines uh, cross each other. So now we get into persuasion or manipulation. Um, this is used when we use persuasion techniques too aggressively or recklessly, such as emphasis, isolation, it becomes a, a deceptive technique of exaggeration, omission, or even equivocation. The line between persuasion and deception isn't always clear. The best way to negotiate it is to understand what the most common techniques are. 
So the most common techniques is the truncated y-axis. And you'll notice in the left chart, the y-axis does not start at zero. And as a result of that, you get this upward slope. On the right, the same data is shown with the zero, and those five histograms are totally useless because they don't show anything. So neither of these two graphs really works. So that suggests that we need a different graph type, or maybe we're trying to chart the wrong variable that's part of our analysis. Sometimes we get this double y-axis, the idea that our chart has the y-axis on the left side and on the right. Now, the question here is, are the two time series related and relevant to each other, or are we just trying to save space? Because if we're just trying to save space, then we should make two charts. If there's no rela critical relationship between these two. So for example, if one is revenue and the other is net income, fine. But if one is sales in one quadrant and sales in another quadrant, who cares? That's not relevant to each other. So sometimes using a map can be hugely effective. However, it can be very dangerous because the largest area, places like Ontario and Quebec, had better have the largest value because that, that's what's gonna stand out regardless of what your data says. And if the most important thing you wanna hone in on is Prince Edward Island, this map is gonna be the most useless idea anybody's ever come up with. So be very careful with that. Let's look at some manipulative idea. Here we've got cumulative annual revenue. Looks okay. But in fact, annual revenue, if I take out the cumulative, is actually going down. These two charts show the same data. So clearly by showing a chart on the left, people are trying to mislead their audience into thinking that there isn't a problem when indeed there is a problem. Much better strategy is to acknowledge the problem and then spend most of your time detailing the strategy to resolve the problem. Aside from ethical issues, these charts are really boring. Okay, here's a good one. Chart shows a close correlation between revenue generated by arcades and the number of computer science doctorates awarded in the USA. High correlation, right? Is there any relevance between these two? No, there's absolutely none. So we're misleading our audience with this chart. So what's the difference between a bogus correlation and a legitimate correlation, something where there is causation. When you have a legitimate correlation, it can be explained through a, a plausible story. This, these two lines cannot be related to each other with a plausible story. So make sure that you don't base your work on an exciting correlation for which there is no basis in fact. And there's a lot of that going on in the real world. It happens all the time. How's it done in Dilbert land? As requested, I fit my presentation on one PowerPoint slide. I had to use all of the white space, but I think it was worth it to fit everything on one page. It's actually only one bullet point, but it's a long one. As we observe yet again, Wally is embroiled in a ridiculous dysfunctional situation. There's no rule that a presentation must fit on one PowerPoint slide. There's a rule that we should not present too many PowerPoint slides. There's a rule that we should not dense pack text on the slide. There's a best practice that white space is valuable for effective communication. There are always multiple credible ways to develop presentations with visualizations that engage and excite the audience and lead to commitment to the recommendations. Wally's idea, as always, are not credible and are born of misunderstanding. Okay, our fourth segment here is present and practice visualizations. So we want to talk about how do you prevent to present to persuade and how do you do a visual critique? First up is show the chart and stop talking. I'm showing this from CNN. I don't know how many of you have seen this, but this is an impressive piece of software that CNN uses for its elections. I love the user interface. I love the graphics. So have a look at that sometime. Even if you're not a fan of CNN, you can admire their technology. The point here is 
give the audience a chance to absorb what the chart is saying. Talk about the ideas of the chart. Don't describe the chart. Don't talk about the structure of the chart. Guide the audience through any unusual visual forms that are going on so people come to appreciate what you're trying to say. Sometimes it's useful to use a reference chart that talks not just about your uh, data, but other people's data as a reference point. Sometimes it's useful to just turn off the chart because typically people are spending time looking at the chart, not you. So if you want to get their attention, you need to press B like this and cause a heart attack in Jeff, who might think that we now have a big problem. And before it gets too serious, press B again, and we're back to the presentation. That's a tiny little PowerPoint keystroke that can have a big impact on your presentation. Show something simple. Don't show something complicated that overwhelms your audiences. Okay, how do I create tension? How do I improve my engagement? Well, notice how I'm doing it here through a little bit of animation. This is back to the whole idea of, of motion. Wherever you can introduce motion, it's a good thing. Use time. I think we've all seen these um, visualizations that move forward in time and change as they go along. Zoom in, zoom out. Help people understand the context of the data that you have. Deconstruct and reconstruct, which is really a way of saying drill down into the data. And above all, tell a story around the data. That will be very engaging in your audience, to your audience. Okay, what about this example? A minimalist approach communicates best. It's positives here, it's visually attractive, it's engaging, great use of color, no bold, saturated, or overwhelming amounts of color, clear labeling of the data time series without a legend, enough data for an extended trend. It's indicative of the relative position across countries. But what are the negatives here? Well, there's no units of measure. There's the assumption that the vertical distance, likely emission volume, is the same between every two countries. Well, that's ridiculously unlikely. The spacing of the dots horizontally and ver vertically suggests data rigor to me. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. The black background provides some good contrast to the dots and lines. However, would white or cream have been a better choice because those colors aren't as dominant as black? What do you think? Like everything else, you can overdo the minimalist approach. In Dilbert land, what happens there? Someone told me your presentation was confusing and unpersuasive. Sometimes one person person's inability to understand looks like another person's inability to explain. I don't understand what you said. See? Now, the point here is it's our responsibility as presenters to ensure that our audience understands our message. It's never the audience's fault when they don't understand our message. So I hope we'll all keep that in mind. So here are some recommendations. Uh, understand visualizations. Enhance your understanding of data visualization by reading and exploring the vast available work on the web. Widen your familiarity with incredible variety of visualizations that you can view there. And also look at the vendor galleries. Every vendor has got uh, huge websites that showcase how wonderful their product is. You can also look at the reading list at the end of the presentation. Secondly, create visualization, experiment in the design of visualization, try different charts, avoid ornamentation, keep it simple, and don't just keep whatever comes to mind first. Refine your visualizations, never be satisfied with the first version. You'll notice that the bottom chart here I think is way more effective than the top chart. Present and practice your visualization, take time to practice the presentation. I think it's important to present to an empty room out loud. You can always rent a, oh, sorry, book a meeting room. I guess you can rent it too. This bathroom technique is not as outrageous as it may first appear. I think it can be very effective. And don't just do it quietly. 
Okay, with those ideas in mind, I think that's how we can be effective. And let me close on this. Never trust summary statistics. Always visualize your data. It can be difficult to demonstrate the importance of data visualization. Some people are under the impression that charts are simply pretty pictures while all the important information can be divined through statistical analysis. I don't buy either of these points. So make sure your data doesn't have any weird stuff in it and you can always check that by visualizing it. So, we're at the end. I hope that was a rapid run through a whole lot of ideas on how to improve your data visualization. And now we'll turn some time over to some questions, even though the boss said, don't ask any questions. That's Back great, Yogi. That's great, Yogi. Thanks very much. It's a fascinating presentation. A lot of uh, really amazing food for thought there. So, uh, so please, uh, if you have any questions, send them to me in the uh, chat um, and we'll try to get to them. A few have, have come in already, Yogi, so we'll go through some of them. Um, We'll go through some of those. Um, one question is around, do you have any recommended open source visualization software? Okay, so there is a huge variety of open source software. And most of it is, is based on JavaScript libraries. So that's fine if you are a developer with enough skills in, in using that software. So examples of that are fusion charts that I mentioned before and the software package called D2. These are excellent pieces of open source software that I can recommend to anybody. Now, my experience is that people look for open source software because, and you may not like this, they don't know how to tell management that management needs to spend some money to get the, the software that they really need to be powerful and effective. So I'm a great believer in the four that I've mentioned that I think are very powerful, Power BI, SAS, Tableau, and Tibco Spotfire. Those are excellent pieces of software and your development productivity, because they're all GUI based, as opposed to a JavaScript, is dramatically better. And they also have lots of ETL capability uh, built into them. So I think if, if, you want, if you want to spend your time being a developer, fine, use the open source. But if you want to be around adding business value in your organization and speeding the process along, then use those, one of those commercial packages. Now you may say, well, wait a minute, I find it very difficult to sell my boss on these concepts. And I would say, absolutely, you're right. So I would point you to one of my articles at IT World Canada that talks about creating and selling the business case for data visualization at your organization. Great. I don't know if anybody likes that answer, but Okay, that's thank, thanks for that, Yogan. I, I would just mention that, you know, in the nonprofit uh, social sector, of course, where uh, budgets can be very tight, um, one of the, uh, there are a number of software products that um, are either freely available or available for a uh, very low cost. Yeah. So there's an organization called TechSoup, um, spelt as it, as it sounds. And TechSoup is a great organization that actually makes that connection between uh, software providers and getting that software into nonprofit social organizations. Um, so check that out. Okay. Right. So, so, but you know, to me, 
nonprofits, government organizations, or, pro or for-profit company. I put them all in the, lump them all together. The effectiveness and productivity of their people is just as important in any one of those. And, and I know what you just said is true, and maybe my views are very much an outlier, but I don't think that's how you effectively use your people. All right, let's, let's move on to a few more questions then. Um, so there's a questions about, you know, some of the, you know, the conventions that you mentioned and, and uh, you know, there are many of them, right? Like, you know, time moving from left to right and various other things, but like, is there a sort of a, a reference or a, a, a nice guide that kind of documents some of the, the key conventions for data visualization that might be out there? I think these conventions are well described in a number of data visualization books and web pages, and they're actually all embedded in, in the uh, software that I mentioned. So when you, when you pick a, 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 a visualization type off the gallery at one of these pieces of software, the the vendor proudly proclaims that they've built those ideas into their software already in the way they've pre-built the templates. So for example, it's really hard to find a, a, a chart template where time goes up the y-axis. So the short answer is yes, the reference material is out there. Okay, and there's a kind of a specific question here, but I mean, I think it's, it might be helpful. Um, so it is the um, stacked bar charts, similar to pie charts, show the relativity between elements. And without data labels, it's difficult to understand the true value um, of the elements. So why aren't st stacked bar charts considered it as undesirable as bar charts for visualization. Sorry, stacked bar charts. Yeah, I, I was critical today of pie charts. I did not mention stacked bars. And I agree with whoever is asking the question is that those stacked bars can be difficult to read, just like stacked lines can be difficult to read sometimes. So again, if you're looking at the chart and you're saying to yourself, gee, this is going to be difficult for my audience, you're making an important, you've reached an important conclusion and you need to change your, your chart type. So there are a couple of questions about some of the references and books that, that you mentioned. Uh, I'll just sort of say again that the presentation deck uh, will be available uh, tomorrow on the meetup site uh, under this event. Uh, as as will the recording of the presentation, so you can you can use that for uh, for reference. Yeah, there's so there's so there's a bunch of uh, bibliography pages at the back of the presentation. Let me just well, I guess whoops. So I guess this version of the presentation doesn't have the bibliography. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, any recommendations for the creation of infographics? Uh, yeah, that's a, a whole other topic. And yeah, um, I guess the answer is no, I don't, I don't have a lot of expertise in that particular realm. Um, okay, fair so enough. That help. Right. And there are some questions about, um, about colors and how many colors and that sort of thing. So kind of best practices. I guess you, you probably already sort of alluded to some of the books and some of the uh, you know, vendor uh, uh, demos that uh, show some of these kind of uh, practices. But any comments on colors or use of colors? Yeah, so, so the issue for me is, is twofold. So for example, 
when you when you just use I don't know spot fire and you pick on a certain chart type it selects all the colors for you unless you go out of your way to make a change and and they're claiming to you that they've made the right choices so if you don't agree then go and make the change it what I'm always keen on is what I call first of all contrast are are the different colors you're using sufficiently distinguishable from the other colors you're using and does your background enhance or detract from that contrast so that that's two considerations another consideration is some people are a little bit colorblind including me or a lot colorblind and if you have people you know you have people in the, your audience like that it's often a good idea to maybe demo what you're going to do in a rehearsal to those people and see if there's any whoopses that are causing a problem for those people to understand your message. Well, Yogi, there's you've already you've obviously stimulated a lot of interest. There's there's a, a large number of additional questions. Um, you know, we can maybe refer to the these to you later and maybe provide some of your responses if, if you would if you would like to do that and then make that available to the group. Um, well, okay, so I'm happy to have you say, if you need to go, go. If you want to listen some more, we can stay around. Or are you, or do you need to get off? Well, I think I think we want to have this at a reasonable length for the for the recording, okay. uh, and I think you know, people do have other places to go. So we'll 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 try to pass those along to you and see if we can get some responses. Um, but you know, uh, you you really uh, hit the chord here with everybody. And this is a hugely important uh, important area for everybody. And the work that we do as data, data analysts and, and data scientists. So uh, again, uh, uh, really appreciate your time and your energy and your enthusiasm. And uh, thanks everybody uh, for attending uh, this evening's uh, webinar uh, uh, put on by Data for Good. And please look at our meetup site and sign up for the, um, for the future events. Take care. Stay home and stay safe. Good night, Jeff. Good night, everybody else.